From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Robert Ecker, Mr. Parsons' secretary. You telephone this office for an appointment with Mr. Parsons. That's right. I'm an investigator, Mr. Ecker. I was sent here by Eastern Casualty and Trust. We understand David Parsons is missing. I want to talk to Mr. Parsons Sr. about it. Oh. Well, Mr. Parsons Sr. isn't in the office today. He's home ill. This is pretty important, Mr. Ecker. Maybe I'd better call him at home. Why don't you come to the office? I'll try to arrange to take you out there. I don't want to be a lot of trouble. There'd be more trouble if I didn't. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Eastern Casualty and Trust Company, number 25, Yardley Boulevard, Boston, Massachusetts. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Calicles matter. Expense account item one, two hundred dollars five cents. Airfare and incidentals, Hartford to Los Angeles. I arrived at midnight, went straight to the Beverly Hilton, had a good night's sleep, and woke up to an early spring heat wave. By nine o'clock, I had placed my call to Parsons Stocks and Bonds. At ten o'clock, I met Robert Ecker in person. He was a man about my age with a thin face and good clothes. Judging from his office, the job of secretary was a pretty responsible one. I don't quite understand this, Mr. Dollar. What made you think that Mr. Parsons Jr. is missing? Is he around? You mean, is he in town? Yeah, is he in town? Is he around? Can I see him? Well, none of us exactly knows where he is, but he's not what you'd call missing. Well, now, that depends on how you look at it, Mr. Recker. We understand David Parsons hasn't been seen for ten days. Is my information wrong? Well, no, no, what you say is true. You mean you're here to look into the matter? That's about it. May I say something? Sure. When you're speaking of David Parsons in front of his father, Mr. Parsons Sr., I suggest that you don't use that word missing. I'll try to remember that. The connotation might upset him. I'm certain he doesn't regard Mr. Parsons' absence in the missing sense. Maybe you can tell me how he does regard it. I'm afraid I can't. Mr. Parsons Sr. doesn't confide in me. How about David Parsons' wife? Sorry. How about your own opinion? I'd rather keep my opinions to myself, Mr. Dollar. There's nothing personal, but uh, Mr. Parsons Sr. is very adamant about certain matters. In other words, uh, Mr. Parsons Sr. does all of the thinking for publication. So to speak, yes. What concern does the uh, Eastern... Casualty and Trust Company have in this matter? Yes. Uh, what is the bonding company's concern? A hundred thousand dollars. It was an automatic write-up on David Parsons, Jr. when he entered the firm. I still don't understand. David Parsons had access to great amounts of money and transferable bonds here. That's where we're responsible, Mr. Recker. Is that an inference? If it sounds like I'm worried that David Parsons might have walked off with some money or some bonds, it's an inference. That's rather ridiculous, isn't it? I don't know whether it is or not, Mr. Recker. I regard it that way. Mr. Parsons is worth a considerable amount of money. A million dollars would be a conservative estimate of his fortune. His father, of course, is, well, Mr. Parsons Sr. Yes, we're well aware of Mr. Parsons' holding. But sometimes things aren't what they seem. You know what I mean? No, I'm afraid I don't know exactly what you mean, Mr. Dollar. Well, now, uh, take these, for instance. Mr. Dollar. Take these. Just Here, these copies of Eastern Casualties' policies on your desk, Mr. Recker. Now, let's see, you call me about nine. It's a little after ten now. That gave you an hour to dig them out, study them over, and answer for yourself the exact questions you've been making me answer. Isn't that about it, Mr. Ecker? Yes. Yes, I'd say that's just about it, Mr. Dollar. Robert Ecker drove me out to the Bel Air home of David Parsons, Sr. On the way, he spoke of the weather, the situation in Algiers, uh, the trouble he had making reservations for weekends in Palm Springs and the low fuel consumption of his new Studebaker Golden Hawk. He avoided very carefully any further mention of David Parsons, Jr., the missing son. I put a couple of direct questions to him, which he answered indirectly by referring me to Mr. Parsons, Sr. So I let it go at that. Jenny? Jenny? Somebody must be around. You said you phoned. I did. 
Jenny. Oh, hello. Hello, Robert. Nobody around? No one so far. They must be upstairs. He's been at it today. Called me over here an hour ago. Oh, I'm Mrs. Parsons. I'm Johnny Dollar. How do you do? I beg your pardon. You shouldn't, Robert. It was purposeful. Uh, Mrs. Parsons. I'm the one you're not supposed to meet, Mr. Dollar. I'm David's wife. I just received orders from upstairs that this matter will be handled upstairs. Is that so? Oh, yes, that's quite so. My father-in-law feels that he has extraordinary competence in this matter. As in all matters, huh, Robert? We'd better get along, Mr. Dollar. How do you feel? Oh, I feel fine. I mean about your father-in-law handling it. That makes very little difference, Mr. Dollar. It's my husband who's missing, but his son. You're a, a policeman or a detective, aren't you? In a way, yes. You look like a very charming man, Mr. Dollar. Becker! Becker, is that you down there? Just a moment, Mr. Parsons. Hurry up! <laughs> you may have to practice some charm on him. Thank you for the tip, Mrs. Parsons. Not at all. It was nice to have met you. Good morning, Robert. Good morning, Mrs. Parsons. We'd better get up there. Ecker! Robert Ecker led me upstairs into a massive bedroom that could only have been decorated for a massive old man which is exactly what David Parsons Sr. turned out to be. Six and a half feet tall, I guessed at it, since he was stretched out in bed. He had a pair of coal black eyes and white hair, liberally sprinkled with gray. He spilled a briefcase full of papers and documents off the bed, punched his pillow around, and glared hard at me. What's his name? This is Mr. Dollar, Mr. Parsons. You see we had any credentials? No, sir. Well, I... find out! Mr. Dollar. Sure, sure. Here, Look these over. I'll look them over. Hand them to me. Yes, Mr. Parsons. They could be forgeries. It could be a newspaper report or something like that. Go downstairs and use the hall phone. Call this company and see if they have anyone named Johnny Dollar working for them. Hurry it up. Yes, sir. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Those credentials are genuine. You know it and I know it, Mr. Parsons. I'm not waiting around here while you call Boston and talk to someone there you won't believe either. Now, I'm at the Beverly Hilton. You call me when you've made up your mind to talk about this matter. Fine. Now get out. I got in town last night and contacted your office first thing. I wanted to talk to you about it first for several reasons. One, you're David Parsons' father. It's your company, not his, that can be jeopardized in a situation like this. Two, you seem the logical man to see to clear up the matter easily. Now that I've seen you, I'm not so sure of that. I'll have to go to somebody else. Wait a minute. What do you mean, go to somebody else? I mean, I'm not going to sit in a hotel room cooling my heels waiting for you to call me. I have to find out about this, and there are other people to talk to. Your son's wife, the whole household. <laughs> they wouldn't let you in. The police, if I have to. I'd break you. I'd break you in half. Then I'd get pretty mad, and both halves of me would figure this thing out if it took a million years and a million dollars. Ecker. Yes, sir? Get out of here. Yes, sir. You've got five minutes. I've got five minutes and ten minutes and a million minutes if I need them. We have a report your son's been missing for ten days now. One of our brokers reported it. He happened to be one of your son's clients. Missing. All right, where is he? How would I know? I take that to mean you don't know. Do you have any ideas? Of course not. Have you had an audit of your books since he disappeared? What? Have you had an audit? Is there anything missing? Bonds, cash in the company? Ecker! Ecker! Throw this bum out of here and make sure he bounces a couple of times. Mr. Parsons. Throw him out! I've got you by a good 25 pounds, Ecker. Maybe you'd better leave, Mr. Dollar. I think I'll stay. Oh, if I could get out of this bed, I'd do it my... Ecker! Run along, Mr. Ecker. He'll calm down. I can wait him out. You leave without throwing him out and you're fired. Throw him out! I'll wait for you downstairs, Mr. Dollar. <clears throat> All right. Sit down. What day is today? Friday. It was a week ago Tuesday. David left the house, according to his wife, and that's the last anyone saw him. No word, nothing since then. No police? Of course not, no police. I can hear you, I can hear you. Why? You know why as well as I do. An investment broker missing. What the papers wouldn't do with that? What's been going on? Nothing. We've been waiting to hear from him. No one's done anything. What is there to do that won't bring out the press? Look, I'm not worried about the press. I'm worried about your son, Mr. Parsons. Whatever happened to him has had a ten-day start. And nothing's been done about it. Now, how about the books? What about them? Have you had an audit? Now, look here, you Keep young... Your voice now, will you? I ask you a simple question. Have you found anything missing? I haven't looked. Where are you going? Well, if what you say is true, no one's seen or heard of David Parsons for ten days, then I'm going to get some help. What help? Police. I don't want any police in on this. 
How much does your responsibility come to? A hundred thousand dollars. I'll post it in cash. You'll what? I'll post that amount of money and assume your liability, if there is a liability. You'll never get a fair offer than that. I don't want this matter to get into the papers. Well? Look, Mr. Parsons, we have assumed liability, and we can't transfer it at this date. It's, it's out of the question. So let's start our planning from there. I met Mrs. Parsons downstairs. I understand she's not supposed to meet me or see me. Now, is that right? Yeah. Well, you better fix up that part of it. That's so? Yeah. Suppose I don't. I'll see her anyhow. Get out of here! He was looking for something to throw when I stepped out the door and walked down the hall to the stairway. At the foot of the stairs, I looked around for Robert Eckert, who wasn't around. I found my head by the door, and then I ran into Mrs. Parsons again. Mr. Dollar. Yes? What's been decided? What's he going to do about David? Well, it's pretty hard to say what he's going to do about anything. What are you going to do? I was going to drive over to your house this afternoon and ask you to go to the police and make out a missing persons report. If you refuse to do that, I was going to the police myself and ask their help. Oh, do you think that's the thing to do? I mean, a missing person report? Yep, I think that's the thing to do. I'll be home later this afternoon. He might hear it. All right. Say two o'clock? Fine. He cool off? Oh, for a second or two. <laughs> Some museum piece he is. Be careful of him, Mr. Dollar. He'll break your heart. He's your kind. You're his dish of meat. Uh, yeah. I didn't pay much attention to that remark from Robert Ecker. I thought about Svengali and Rasputin and a couple of fellows like that. I didn't think of Parsons Sr. in the same class with them. But I should have guessed it. Ecker's trying to tell me, but I just wouldn't listen. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, some more facts about how the Earth swallowed a man. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Mrs. David Parsons. Well... I called Mr. Ecker and he told me where you're staying. I was just on my way out to your home, Mrs. Parsons. Oh, I'd rather you didn't come to the house, Mr. Dollar. Couldn't I meet you somewhere? 
Oh, sure. Better still, why don't I come by your hotel and pick you up? That'll be all right. Fifteen minutes, is that too soon? Oh, that's fine. Uh, Mrs. Parsons? Yes? Your father-in-law know you're meeting me? If he did, I think he'd kill me. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Eastern Casualty and Trust Company, number 25 Yardley Boulevard, Boston, Massachusetts. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Calicles matter. <laughs> Item 2, $4.55, one long-distance phone call to Dave Blaine, Chief Investigator for Eastern Casualty. I explained to him that in spite of our information that David Parsons, Jr. had been missing for 10 days, People in Los Angeles connected with him seemed indifferent or irritated by an investigation. I told him how old man Parsons had tried to throw me out three times when I got around to suggesting that perhaps his son might have flown the coop with some money and bonds. Blaine told me to keep trying and keep on trying to get to the bottom of it. I took him at his word. It was a little after two o'clock when I saw Mrs. Dorothy Parsons pull up in front of the Beverly Hilton lobby. She wore a ribbon to hold her hair back in a convertible. A sundress showed off a pair of well-tanned shoulders. The dark glasses, the cigarette holder, and the smile did the rest in making her a very pretty woman. I suppose I look worried. I keep you waiting long? No, 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 not at all. What's the matter? Oh, I don't know. Yes, I do, too. It, it just struck me. I'm here to see about your missing husband. Now it looks like we're going on a picnic. You don't have to wear sackcloth and ashes to do your job. No, really, do you? Well, it sometimes helps on a job like this. You disapprove of me, don't you? I disapprove of everybody. I have to, Mrs. Parsons. All the time? Forever? Only until the thing's straightened out. Until you separate the chaff from the wheat, I suppose. Yeah. Where are we going? Well, I thought you might like a drive down to the ocean. I'd rather be facing you across a desk. You shan't do that, Mr. Dollar. I won't allow it. Stop looking so glum. How's that? Oh, I don't know. I just don't know. Would you feel any better if you faced me across a luncheon table? That's as close to a desk as I can think of. Yeah, let's try that out. I gave her what I could of a smile and let her think it over. She drove well, keeping her eyes to the road, both hands on the wheel. She was a careful kind. The rearview mirror was adjusted two or three times looking for traffic cops. We went off Sunset Boulevard and onto the road that is set right by the ocean. The sun was shining. The air was warm. And I got to thinking, what business did I have worrying about a missing man on such a nice day? Oh. What is it? Come on. I'm tired of driving. Let's walk along that lovely strip of beach. Oh, uh, now, wait please, a minute. Please, Mr. Dollar, please. It's such a lovely day and the air is so good. Walk with me. Talk with me. Just a little while and then we can talk about all these other things, please. I married David when I was not quite 18. He was almost 30. You see, that was 14 years ago. 14 years. Go on. He joined his father's firm, and he's been there ever since. We live well, socially, economically. I guess I belong to the keep your social position in mind club, don't I? I don't know. What do you think of me? I, uh, met you today to talk about your husband, Mrs. Parsons. But I've been talking about my husband. I told you about meeting him, about being married to him. What else is there to tell? Now tell me about missing him. What can I tell you about that? Well, where he is, for one thing. I don't know. Any ideas? No, none. You're so pretty, I almost believe you. Oh, uh, you are a human being. But I don't believe you. I don't care. Tell me how pretty I am. I don't understand you. I didn't understand your father-in-law. David Parsons is missing. No one wants to talk about it, do anything about it, make any moves. Now, what is this? You're cross with me now. Yeah, yeah. 
For some reason, I'd assume you'd want me to talk to somebody about your husband. You'd want to talk to somebody, too, that you'd, that you'd want him back, want to know if he's well, if he's in trouble. And what happens? You spend an hour on a sunny afternoon showing me your best profile, doing everything, but getting down to the business at hand. I don't get it. I'm sorry. I guess I don't blame you. What is it you want to know? When did you see him last? Last Tuesday morning at breakfast at home. Tell me about it. There's nothing to tell, really. He ate his breakfast, read his paper, put on his coat, kissed me and left. I called his office at noon about something or other, and his secretary told me he hadn't come in. I really didn't know he wasn't around till Wednesday afternoon late. How's that? Well, Tuesday night, I... I went out with friends. Wednesday, I slept late. I presume David was in bed when I came in. I didn't look in his bedroom. Wednesday afternoon, Mr. Ecker called and asked to speak to David. Mr. Ecker told me David hadn't been in his office all day Tuesday. I checked his bedroom, and his bed hadn't been slept in Tuesday night, so I called my father-in-law. Why didn't you call the police? Why should I? It only seems reasonable to me. Go on. Mr. Parsons told me not to mention the matter to anyone, that he'd take care of it. He hinted... Oh. I'm bad at this, Johnny, because well, you have no idea... Well, I mean, Mr. Parsons Sr. doesn't hint. He's a very blunt person. I met him this morning, yeah. But I'll say he hinted that David might have gone off with someone else. I see. Has he ever disappeared before? Oh, yes, many times. When was the last time? Oh, last fall. For three days he was gone. And before that, it was in the spring. He was gone for a matter of five or six days. When he came home on these occasions, uh, what did he say? What did he do? Nothing. Oh, no, I can't believe that. I mean, if he's gone a few days without leaving any kind of word, when he returned, he must have had some explanation for it. Oh, I suppose he did. He might have said something about getting even. I don't recall. Well, look at me. Now, this is serious. I'm looking at you. You said you've been married to him 14 years. You said he joined his father's firm shortly after. Yes. What did he do before that? He studied and traveled. Didn't work? Well, he wrote or something. I don't know. What kind of a man is he? He's David Parsons, Jr. He's impeccable, brilliant, and honest. As a husband. Aren't you overstepping yourself somewhere? A lot of personal questions will have to be answered about him by someone. He's a very devoted husband and father. Except for those times when he disappears. Except for those times, yes. Do you suppose he'll reappear this time? Yes, of course. Why? Don't you? He's your husband, not mine. The wind's coming up. Yes. Feel like some lunch? I feel very much like going home. All right. Mrs. Parsons. Yes. Did you expect me to make love to you out here this afternoon? What kind of a question is that? It's to the point. Did you? Yes. Why? It's not a nice question to ask me. I think sometimes I'm quite attractive. Well, I think you must be attractive all the time. Thank you. Why didn't you kiss me? We uh, don't have to go into that. Unless, of course, you want to tell me why you stole me all afternoon. Do you? Touche, Mr. Dollar. One thing more. When I spoke with you earlier, you asked my advice in this matter. I advise you call the police about your husband. Did you? You know I did. I also advised your father-in-law to do the same thing. He said he'd kill me and himself before he'd call the police in. You said, or I thought you said, you'd call him in anyhow. That you were concerned about your husband and wanted him found. Did I get that wrong? I don't want any police, Mr. Dollar. I don't think they're necessary. David will come back. No police. What made you change your mind? Your father-in-law? You said you only had one more question. I lied. I've got a thousand questions. I should call home. Come on. We walked up to the highway and climbed back into the car. She drove to the nearest filling station and public telephone booth. I waited in the car while she made a phone call. Some high school kids drove up in a jalopy in sweatshirts and jeans. They waved ten pounds of wieners at me for no reason at all and asked me if I'd like to go on a wiener fry. I told them no. An old man with a bamboo fishing pole came in. He dropped a soggy gunny sack on the pavement while he disappeared around at the back. 
I went over and peeked in. Three pretty good-sized perch smelled out at me. I looked off at the ocean, just in time to see a pair of surfboard riders catch the creamy top of a roller, climb up on their feet, and wave to their girlfriends sitting in the sand. Nothing was wrong with the world. Nothing at all. Life was going on just fine. David Parsons, Jr. had been missing ten days, and nothing was wrong at all. I lit up a cigarette. What difference did it make if a man was missing ten days? Not a bit. Especially to his wife, who looked her prettiest when she told me practically nothing about his disappearance. The ashes fell on my lap. I'm sorry I took so terribly long, Mr. Dollar. I had to call my father-in-law's home, too. There was a message for me. Look, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go over your head, your father-in-law's head, everybody's. When I get back in town, I'm going to tell the police about this. I just decided while I was sitting waiting for you. There won't be any need for that. Huh? David's come back. What? He's home. Now, that was the message. He'll be there when we get there. You see, all of your worry was for nothing. You and I, we could have had a perfectly lovely afternoon if we'd known this, couldn't we? If you say so, Mrs. Parsons. <laughs> You all right, brother? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, take it easy. Better give me a hand with her. Can somebody call an ambulance? Yeah, sure. You you take it easy. I'll take care of her until... Why? 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 What is it? I'm sorry, mister. She's dead. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, trouble comes early and stays late. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. What are you doing lying around the hospital? This is Dave Blaine, Johnny. Are you here in Los Angeles? No, I'm in Boston still. What happened? I was with Mrs. Parsons this afternoon, trying to find out what happened to her husband. She missed a turn in the road. How is she? Is she all right? She was killed, Dave. Oh, good Lord. Johnny, what can I do to help? Nothing, Dave. Nothing much to do now. Parsons is back, and... Well, now he's back, I'll wrap it up. Johnny, what is 
it, pal? She was a pretty nice person, Dave. I saw her die. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Eastern Casualty and Trust Company, number 25, Yardley Boulevard, Boston, Massachusetts. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Calicles matter. Item 3, 26 cents for a package of cigarettes, which the night nurse at St. John's Hospital bought for me. She also brought in a sedative. That was the last thing I remembered until about 5 o'clock in the morning. Look out, look out! Look out! Mr. Dollar! Look out! Hey, here. Uh, You've got a bad dream. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. You just lie down. You, you. you need some rest. Yeah. Can I get yeah. you anything, Mr. Dollar? Some water? No. No, sister. No, no, thank you. What's your name? I'm Sister Amadea. You. You weren't here when they brought me in. No. Now you just go back to sleep. Uh, sister, wait. Yes? I'd like to talk to you about it. Of course. You mean the accident? Yes. Yes. Uh, all of it. I, I'd feel better. Well, we want you to do that. Certainly. I came to Los Angeles for an insurance company back east. Mm-hmm. We had a report that a big executive in a stock firm out here was missing. I see. A man named David Parsons, junior partner with his father in the stock and bond business. Oh, yes. I've heard of the Parsons family. I talked to a man named Ecker... Old Mr. Parsons' secretary. Mm-hmm. Hecker took me out to see the old man. He was pretty nasty. Wouldn't talk much about his son being gone for ten days. Then I met David Parsons' wife. I told her I thought the matter should go to the police. She agreed with me. But later on this afternoon, out by the ocean, she said she expected him to come back. She called the house, and they said David Parsons had come back. Oh. It was a strange afternoon, sister. I mean, we sat in the sand and talked about these things. Mm-hmm. I could have fallen in love with her. Maybe I did. I'll never know. Sister Amadea. Oh, Mr. Dollar, you're more shaken up than you think. Well, really, you should... I'll never get used to things like this. Shh. Now you just sleep, Mr. Dollar. Go on, now go to sleep. The world becomes very heavy sometimes. Shh, I'll just go to sleep. Item four, $14.95, one night in the hospital. When I got back to the Beverly Hilton, I bought a copy of the morning paper, ordered some lunch, and sat down to read about my accident. An unidentified woman was killed. An unidentified man was slightly injured in a car crash on Sunset Boulevard the afternoon before. No names, no details, no nothing. Strange. But even stranger was the appearance of Robert Ecker, old man Parsons' secretary at my door. Then I didn't know why his eyes were red-rimmed. Hello, Dollar. How do you feel? Oh, all right now, I guess. Come in. This whole thing's pretty terrible, Dollar. I... I just have to see how you feel. Is there anything I can do for you? No, no, nothing, thanks. Mr. Parsons wanted you to know that he's concerned for you. Tell him I'm okay. How are things there? Young Mr. Parsons is pretty broken up. He's really back then? Oh, yeah. Well, then, I'm just about through out here. Could I see him? Mr. Parsons thought you'd want to. Yes. <laughs> Expense account, item eight, $178, airplane ticket, back to Hartford. Item nine, $43, hotel and board for two days in Los Angeles. Item ten, $6, cab fare. My plane was scheduled to leave at nine o'clock that night. I checked out about four in the afternoon and went directly to the home of David Sr. 
He looked a little ashen when I came in, but his temper hadn't improved much. He pointed a crooked finger at me. I've got this to say to you right now, Dollar. If you hadn't insisted on talking to her, she'd be alive today. She wouldn't have been with you driving that car. If she hadn't been forbidden by you to see me, we wouldn't have had to drive around in a car. You have a drink around here? Right there. I didn't come here to argue with you anymore. My job was to find your son. Evidently, he wasn't lost. Ecker told me I could meet him here about this time. You're pretty free with my whiskey. You can afford it. You want one? Oh, I get a jigger before every meal, that's all. Cheers. Well, am I early or what? David will be here any time now. Have any arrangements been made yet? You'll have to ask uh, Ecker about that. I don't know. I'd like to send some flowers, something. That's always the logical gesture. This is Mr. Dollar, David. Come in. It's my son, David. The man in the black suit wasn't what I expected in the way of David Parsons, Jr., somehow. He was tall and rangy, almost athletic. He had a good sunburn, a pair of square shoulders. I would have read him for an advertising man or a pro ball player. Certainly not for the investment brokerage business. We shook hands. He smiled wanly and lit up a cigarette. Dad tells me you've been looking for me. That's right, Mr. Parsons. Where have you been all this time? Well, I took a freighter out of Los Angeles and rode it up to Oregon. Just a whim. Wanted to be alone and do some thinking. How come no word? Oh, that's a whim, too. Are you trying to get into my personal life? No, no. Just curious again. Well, here's some reports I have to make out. If you'd sign them, I'd appreciate it. Go ahead. Sign them. Let them go. Sure, sure. I have a pen. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Satisfied, Dollar? Completely. Uh, what ship did you take up there? Ship? Uh, the boat to Oregon. Oh, the, uh, Laureen B. Wintermaker Timber Company ship. Oh, sure. Well, I'm glad you're okay. Thank you for your cooperation. I went back to my hotel, checked in once more, canceled my airline reservations, and put in a call to Robert Ecker. He wasn't in his office. A little arguing got me his home number. No one answered. I went out and spent $25 item eight to rent a car. I drove it over to Ecker's apartment address. He wasn't in, so I waited. A half an hour later, he drove up, ran into his apartment for about a minute and a half, came back out and got into his car. When he pulled into traffic on Wilshire, I was one Buick behind him. He finally stopped at a place on Olympic Boulevard, the Parkway Funeral Home. I waited five minutes and then walked in. Robert Ecker stood in a semi-dark room, hands folded before him as if in prayer. He was looking down at the body of David Parsons' wife. Hello, Ecker. Hello. Came by to pay my respects. Sure. Sure. Who is she, Ecker? What was that? Who is this girl? She isn't Dorothy Parsons. I know that much. Who is she? <laughs> we better talk about this. Yeah. Yeah, we better talk. Her name's Ellen. Her name was Ellen Myers. We're going to be married. I'm sorry. She was one of those lonely people that you find in this town. I mean, she worked a bit in pictures and drew and painted a little bit. I don't know how I met her. I just know that she was fresh and lovely and she'd do anything for me. Or for old man Parsons. For me. She was mine. Everything else is his. She was mine. He... Blew up the other morning when I called up and said you were in town looking for David Jr. He said we had to steer you out. He didn't want you talking to anybody. So he arranged that she'd be there posing as Mrs. Parsons. He asked me to get someone. She was delighted with the idea. It was kind of a little game for her. Where's the real Mrs. Parsons? Home, I guess. I don't know. I'll find that out. Now, tell me who's the guy I shook hands with this afternoon who said he was David Parsons Jr.? I don't know his name. Someone the old man hired to play the part for. Him. Then David Parsons is still missing. Yeah. Why all the cover-up? Why doesn't the old man want him found? He does want him found. He wants him found in the worst way. He's 
He's been turning the country upside down looking for him for a week now. There's something like 23 operators from a private detective firm looking for him, but he doesn't want it to go to the police. He wants it out of the papers at all costs. Why? Parsons is going to merge with Little and Tennyson. You've heard of them? Yeah. The old man's got to take it easy. Heart attack. Parsons Jr. will get into the saddle when the merger happens. He'll take over the whole play. That is, of course, with the old man sitting down in Palm Springs dictating orders to him. In other words, old man Parsons wants his figurehead to be on deck clean and unsullied for the merger. That's it. What do you think happened to Junior? I don't have any idea. What happens to any of us who work for Parsons? We give him lip at first, we get mad at him. In the end, he shakes out all the dignity and honesty you might ever have, and he makes you his own personal robe. Look at me, Dollar. He got me to make my girl play all that out in front of you. Now she's dead, and I'm still a robot for her. Take it easy. Yeah, sure. How did you get on to Junior? Well, he didn't look broken up. He was a pretty bad actor. He also gave some wrong answers about being off on a ship and so on. Hey, look. You don't have to say anything about talking to me. Oh, but I will. I'll tell Parsons you pumped it all out of me. We'll worry him a bit. He'll figure out some other way to stop you. I told you once before, darling. He'll break your heart. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of the Callicles Matter. Tomorrow, we find out that Callicles was a Greek. Maybe the greatest one of them all. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ready with your Crestview number, Mr. Dollar. Good. Yeah? Mr. Parsons? Who's this? Johnny Dollar. What are you doing in town? Still looking for your son, Mr. Parsons. You met him yesterday. He's been found. He wasn't lost. So I much. met the man you hired to convince me that he was your son. I know he isn't. Listen, if you're going to make trouble... I will if I have to. I have that guy's signature on two papers in my briefcase. It constitutes a witness forgery, no matter how you look at it. I'd be willing to call up a lawyer and see what kind of noise I can make. What do you want? I'll be out to tell you in 20 minutes. Tonight, 
And every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Eastern Casualty and Trust Company, number 25 Yardley Boulevard, Boston, Massachusetts. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Calicles matter. Expense account item 9, $100, legal retainer. I hired an attorney named Robert Watson to arrange for a court order impounding all the records in the Parsons Brokerage House. I also turned over to him the forged reports. After that, I drove out to see Parsons, still laid up in bed. Who spilled the beans? You did, mainly. I didn't believe that guy here yesterday afternoon. I didn't believe the woman who was supposed to be his wife. So let it go at that. I'm here to find David Parsons, Jr. Let's stop playing games. Don't get fresh with me, boy. I've crunched many a loud talker just like you. You want me to walk out of here and start jamming up your works right now, or do you want to listen? You've botched up everything so far. Do I handle it, or do we keep on like this? I'm going to kill you when I get on my feet. In the meantime, you're going to lie there and like it. I came out here to find your son. You arranged to throw me off his trail by hiring a woman to play his wife and a man to appear and pretend he was your son. Let's take it from there. I understand you've had private detectives looking for him all over the country. What agency? Universal Operators. Who's in charge of it there? A man named Underwood. Have they got any leads? Nothing. Nothing for 12 days. Did he take anything? I don't know. We haven't made an audit. Well, there'll be an audit. I've got the machinery started right now. Who do you think... Shut up and lie down or you'll bust a blood vessel. Is Mrs. Parsons in town? I sent her down to Palm Springs. All right, it's 10.15 now. If I remember right, there's a plane from Palm Springs about noon. Call her there and tell her I'll be at her house at 2 o'clock. I want to talk to her. Are you giving me orders? I sure am. I want everybody in that household there. 2 o'clock, you arrange it. I'll arrange nothing for you. Now get out of here. Call who you have to call. Two o'clock, Mr. Parsons. I left him fuming on the phone and drove my rented car downtown to the offices of Universal Operatives Incorporated. Mr. Underwood, the man in charge of finding David Parsons, Jr., shook my hand and told me he could report nothing to me about the case. I asked him to phone old man Parsons, which he did. That changed his mind. He broke down and gave me an hour-long story on what they'd done to locate the missing man. When he was finished, it came out the same way. They'd run into blank walls everywhere. They had no idea where David Parsons might be. I told Underwood he and his staff were fired and that Mr. Parsons would confirm it. I left him fuming on the phone. Expense account item 10, $4. Two drinks and lunch all along. After that, I drove over to the residence of David Parsons, Jr., Mrs. Parsons was a tall, graceful woman in her late 30s, settled on a sofa in front of the fireplace. The clothes she was wearing, the house itself, the appointments of the formal room, all suggested a well-run, well-kept sort of life. I've answered so many questions from those private detectives. I'm sorry to put you through it all again. You must operate in a rather high-handed manner, Mr. Dollar. My father-in-law expressly told me the point here is not to let any of this get into the papers. The point here is to find your husband, Mrs. Parsons. He's been missing 12 days now. Well, I suppose I was the last one to see him. It was after dinner. He went upstairs. I didn't see him after that. This would be... The 13th. Yes, it was. Did he sleep here that night? His bed had been slept in, yes. Then he really disappeared sometime on the 14th. I suppose that's accurate. He wasn't in his office that day. Did he take a car? No. But I know the private detectives checked the cab companies He to could see have it. flagged one two blocks away. How about clothes? Did he pack anything? Not a thing. Money? I don't know. Okay. Can you think of any enemies who might want to harm your husband? Enemies? Oh, dear, no. Think about it. Well, perhaps in his office, in his business, there's someone. But he never discussed what went on there with me. Mm -hmm. Are you sure? It was a rule. This is our home. That is David's business. We just never talked about what went on in his office at all. How long have you and Mr. Parsons been married? Eighteen years next July. Have you been getting along? Of course we've been getting along. We've gotten along always. Ever discussed the probability of divorce or anything like that? Certainly not. Can you think of any reason why Mr. Parsons would just walk out and not come back? 
None whatsoever. Have the people in this office been worried about him? Well, I believe Mr. Eckers is the only one who knows. The others think he's away on a business trip. In other words, the whole thing's been kept quiet. Oh, yes, of course. This merger situation is quite delicate. As you Mrs. know, Mrs. Parsons, there's... were you very close to him? I beg your pardon. Don't beg my pardon. Just answer the question. Everybody seems to be worried about a merger, not about a man. Did you spend time together, do things together? Of course. We entertained frequently, we traveled, we had common interests. What? Well, our home, of course. What else? I don't know what you mean. Did you enjoy each other, go out together, have fun? Oh, really? <sighs> Did he have a hobby? Well, yes, sort of. David liked to read and write a little. He fancied himself a scholar along some lines. What lines? Literature. Of course, it was just an indulgence. Where did he indulge himself? He had a small study upstairs. Would it be possible to look at that room? Oh, yes, I suppose so. All right, I'll get to that in a minute. Mr. Parson, drink very much? Cocktails before dinner, maybe two or three after. Ever any long drinking jobs on the town? David never went off and drank, if that's what you're trying to find out. Oh, that's what I'm trying to find out. Is he in good health? Yes, perfect, I think. What's the name of his doctor? Oh, uh, Stanley Warner, Dr. Warner. Okay. How about his attitude? What do you mean? What kind of man is he? Quiet, loud, what? Oh, I'd say David is, and always has been, a very quiet person. Like his work? Of course, he loves it. His home? I'm terribly afraid there's a great deal of insinuation in these questions you ask, Mr. Dollar. What have you been doing in Palm Springs? I... resting. Got a boyfriend? Mr. Dollar. Have you? I resent that very much. Naturally, with my husband here, I go out with friends there. David knows about it. He have a girlfriend? You're being ridiculous. No, you're being ridiculous. What? You sit here and describe the kind of association a man has with a drug clerk who sells him cigarettes, and you call it a marriage. Your husband disappears from the face of the earth, and you romp off to Palm Springs, forgetting all about it. You're insulted when I ask you what's wrong. You're hurt when I ask you how common you're annoyed when I mention it. What on earth do you want me to do? File a missing person's complaint right away. Get some help in here if it isn't too late. Too late? It could be, lady. It just could be you and your father-in-law have fooled around too long. She made the call. A half an hour later, two detectives from the Missing Persons Bureau were out here gathering facts. I tagged along. They questioned Mrs. Parsons, the servants. They examined the study as well as his bedroom. From all they could gather, David Parsons had nothing but the clothes on his back when he disappeared. By mid-afternoon, the police had started on old man Parsons and gone downtown to question the members of David Parsons' office force. The district attorney moved in quickly and negated my court order, impounding the books and records for a careful audit to determine if any money or barns were missing. They promised to keep me informed. I went on on my own. Come in, please. Dr. Stanley Warner had a four-suite office on Wilshire Boulevard. He was a big graying man who looked as though he played a lot of golf and drank a lot of whiskey when he had the chance. I told him about Parsons being missing and asked for some details. Well, according to my records, I examined him the first of last month. He was in good health. Excellent for a man of his age and responsibility. Could you explain that, Doctor? No, I was thinking only by comparison. David Parsons is 40 years old. He's held a position of tremendous responsibility for many years. For a lesser man or for a frailer man, the incidence of organic disturbance in this age area increases considerably. David Parsons' case, that didn't seem to hold true. Doctor, are you talking about the pressure from his father? Do you know the old man? Mm-hmm. I'm talking about that, yes. He, he cracked up a lot of people. How do you suppose David Jr. escaped? He knew how to escape, at least for periods of time, get a complete rest. Was there any indication or any reason whatsoever when you examined him to suspect that he might suffer from some sort of uh, mental trouble? No. I'd say that when I examined him, he was in excellent mental shape, too. I see. Did you ever meet him outside the office? Socially? Yeah. Yes. Both belong to the same country club. Played golf with him several times. Seen him at dances, other affairs. Mm -hmm. He and Mrs. Parsons strike you as a happy couple? I'll answer that by saying that happiness is uh, intangible. I envied him, though. Not because of his wife, you understand. But because with with all the requirements that were made of him, 
He was still a gentle, decent man. You ever appear with other women? Not that I know of. Did you ever have occasion to talk with him with his hair down? Once. <laughs> Startled me at first. I was aware that he was a man of education and culture, but I was quite taken aback by his ability to quote the classics. Seemed incongruous somehow. I remember this day we, we met in the club. We had a drink. I don't think anyone was there except the waiters. I was talking to him, and suddenly he dropped off the conversation. He stared ahead, and then he began to quote a Greek, Callicles. Callicles? Yes. I was so impressed by the passage, I took the trouble to look it up myself and write it down. I have it. He, yes. Here. I can still see him quoting that word for word. Read it. But if there were a man who had sufficient force, he would shake off and break through and escape from all this. Go on, will you please? He would trample underfoot all our formulas and spells and charms and all our laws which are against nature. The slave would rise in rebellion and be lord over us. And the light of natural justice would shine forth. <sighs> When did Parsons quote this to you, Doctor? Uh, Monday. The day before he disappeared. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's final intriguing episode of this week's story. The answer is with that old Greek who lived 3,000 years ago. Tomorrow we'll find it. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. David Parsons. Did you read the morning paper? Yep. It's spread all over them. My son missing. I've had calls from New York all morning long. The business merger's jeopardized, and it's your doing. Anything else to say? When I finish with you and your liability company, there won't be enough left to burn for junk. Mr. Parsons, before you shoot off any more steam, do you want me to give the papers the other half of the story? The one about you arranging for people to impersonate your son and his wife? Are you threatening me? I guess I am. Why, you... Bye. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Defense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Eastern Casualty and Trust Company, Boston, Massachusetts. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Calicles matter. Item 11, 10 cents, one newspaper. I lied to Parsons about seeing the paper. I hadn't seen it at all. But I could guess what had happened when they got hold of the story that a prominent broker had been missing some 14 days. It was all there, spread over the front page. I waited a couple of hours before I took old man Parsons on again. You think you're pretty smart, don't you? You should have given this matter to the police in the first place. I gave it to a detective agency. And what do you mean by firing them? Oh, they were just spending your money. And you're losing it for me with all this in the paper. I'm still trying to find your son, Mr. Parsons, remember? You aren't going to find him here. Something's come up. Maybe you can explain it. The DA's office impounded the books yesterday. $5,000 was withdrawn from your son's personal account. What do I have to explain about that? Wait. It was taken out the morning he disappeared. Do you have any idea why he'd withdraw a sum of money that size? No. Do you? Sure. Somebody could have been standing in back of him with a gun, threatening to blow his head off. He might have had a date to go to a wedding and needed some tip money. What can you add? <laughs> You're getting mad, Dollar. Go find your answers someplace else. You don't care if he's ever located, do you? Dollar, let me tell you something. My son means that to me. No more. He's never had brains enough or energy enough to do anything by himself. I do everything. Always have. The only reason I want him back is to affect the merger with Little and Tennyson. You knew that right away. I suppose so. I just wanted to hear it said to believe it. Well, now you've heard me say it. <laughs> you know, one reason why I always run the show, Dollar. My face never looks like yours over anything. I got out of there fast. I went downtown with a tall policeman named Jerry Engel to interview a bank teller. I'm Sergeant Engel. It's Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes, you phoned me. It's about Mr. Parsons. You took care of him when he came in here last Tuesday a week ago, is that right? I handled the withdrawal, yes. We'd like to see the slip on that, please. Yes, I, I looked it up. I have it ready for you. Have you known Mr. Parsons very long? Well, I don't know him well, really. Look at this picture. This man is the same who signed the withdrawal slip last Tuesday morning? Yes, that's Mr. Parsons. Okay. Tell us what happened. Well, he just came up to the cage and handed me the withdrawal slip. That's all. I see. Weren't you a little surprised when he made out a withdrawal slip for $5,000? That's a lot of money. Well, maybe I was a little surprised, but Mr. Parsons has withdrawn large sums from his personal account several times. I always assumed it was some sort of speculation where he needed cash on hand. When he came up to the cage to you, what exactly did he say? Oh, just good morning or, or something like that, and then will you please take care of this? Didn't he stipulate how he wanted the money? Oh, yes, yes, he did say that. I'm sorry. He took it mostly in hundreds and fifties. Any of these bills happen to be recorded? No, Sergeant. Uh -huh. Anything else you can remember about the transaction that might help? Mm, sorry, nothing. Well, well, maybe. Yeah? Well, you both know the kind of business Mr. Parsons is in. I mean, well, it seems like a hurried sort of business. Always phone calls, rushing, and so on. He was always... Always like that, it seemed to me. He'd come in here, do what he had to do, and rush out. Very brisk, you know. But that morning, he didn't seem in a hurry at all when he left. I mean, I had the distinct feeling that Mr. Parsons didn't particularly care in what direction he went. A recheck with Mrs. Parsons and the house servants established that Parsons had not left the house with the described money bag. The police went to work on that angle, trying to find out where he had purchased it. A supplementary bulletin went out with the news about the bag. The district attorney's men were trying to find out if he was involved with another woman, and if so, who. Parsons was reported to be in Toledo, Detroit, the Virgin Islands, and Boston. All the reports were untrue. Yeah, officer, that's him. That's the guy who was in here that night. You sure? Oh, I'm positive that's his picture. Was he with anybody? No, yeah, he was all alone. He sat over there on that stool. How long was he here? Oh, he's here. We closed the joint. Did you happen to see where he went from here? No. And what kind of shape was he in? Drunk? No, no, he was real sober and quiet. Drank all night, but he seemed to hold the stuff okay. Did you talk to him at all? No, just took his order for drinks. He didn't seem to want to talk to anybody. I see. Did you happen to notice if anybody who was in here went over and talked to him? I think a couple of people tried. You know, you get that sort of thing in a joint like this. But he didn't say much to any of them, so they just left him alone. He just sat alone and drank? No, he was making a phone call all the time. He was here, a long-distance call from the booth over there. He sat at the end of the bar so he could hear the phone ring. How do you know he was making a long-distance call? Well, he handed me a 20 once and asked me to change it to quarters for him. All the quarters I had. About what time was this? Oh, I don't know exactly, but it, it took him two or three hours anyway. Do you know if he ever completed his call? 
He poured a lot of dough into the phone. I guess he did, finally. Did he have anything with him while he was here? What do you mean? Was he carrying a little black bag, maybe? No, nothing but his overcoat. I... Yeah. What? He did say something to me at that. Uh, he asked me if I knew Callicles. Callicles? Yes, yeah, Sergeant. Uh, he was about three bourbons along by then. Mean anything? I've heard about that before, Jerry. Callicles was a Greek. Parsons quoted him to his doctor once. Something about a man breaking through and shaking off his chains. A pretty piece of poetry. Poet? I thought he was a bookie. Oh, excuse me. Well, Jerry, one thing for sure. Yeah, what? We know he was alive that night. Jerry Engel started a check with a telephone company. Their records disclosed that David Parsons had placed a call from the pay booth in the bar on the night in question. It had been a person-to-person call to a Kenneth Temple in San Francisco. We tried to place a call to the same number, but there was no answer. We waited another two hours trying to complete the call, and the operators were still trying when we drove out to the Parsons residence once more. Mrs. Parsons gave us a cool greeting. I certainly don't appreciate any of this. You're responsible, Mr. Dollar, for all this publicity. We don't have to go into that, Mrs. Parsons. We need your help now. We found out that your husband called a man named Kenneth Temple in San Francisco the night he disappeared. Oh? That name, Kenneth Temple, does it mean anything to you? No, I've never heard it before. Mr. Parsons never mentioned it to you? Well, I can't say for certain, but it's not familiar to me at the moment. Have you ever been to San Francisco? Yes. When? Twice. Going to and coming back from Hawaii two years ago. Has Mr. Parsons ever been in San Francisco? He was on the same trip. This name, Temple, maybe it was someone you met while you were there. No, I don't recall meeting anyone there at all. Sergeant. Yes? All this has been quite upsetting, quite nerve-wracking, really. I don't know what progress you people are making, but I do wish it would all be handled soon. Excuse me, please. Sure. This isn't getting us very far. I don't get it. Hello? Who? Oh, 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 yes, operator. Just a moment. It's for you, Sergeant. Oh, thanks. Probably San Francisco operator. Thank you. This is Sergeant Engel. Yes? Oh, hello, Mr. Temple. This is Sergeant Engel, Missing Persons Division, Los Angeles Police. Now, we're trying to locate a man named David Parsons. Huh? All right. He's there now. You're huh? going to put him on. David? Well, let me talk to him. Uh, just a minute. Is that an extension? Oh, yes. Please. I'll get it. Let me talk. Hold it a minute. Miss Parsons? I've been pretty worried about you. Yes. Yes, she's all right. She's right here. Okay, Mrs. Parsons. Here, take it. David? How are you? Oh, it's so good to hear your voice, David. When are you coming home? Your father and I have been... I read about it in the papers. Now, I want you to listen to me, Dorothy. Dad's going to ask you, so listen. But... Uh... Listen to me. I'm listening, David. Do you remember all the times that I've asked you to talk to me? The times during these years when I've wanted companionship, warmth, a a home that was lived in? Each time I asked for these things, you were always too busy, too taken up with things outside my life. Do you remember all that? Yes, yes, David, I remember all that. Well, this is the end of you and me. But your father... It's the end of father and me, too, Dorothy. You tell him that. He probably won't believe it, but you tell him the merger's all his. He'll have to get another figurehead. Why, you'd be so angry. Dorothy, what I'm trying to say is his anger doesn't worry me anymore. Oh, what about me? (laughs) I never worried you. But, David... I'm going away. A long sea voyage with Temple. You don't remember him, but he was a sailor I used to talk to aboard ship when we went to Hawaii... He has a boat now. I'm shipping on it. Well, when will you be back? I won't be back. David! Now, will you put that police officer on? Hello, Mr. Parsons. Uh, Who is that? My name is Johnny Dollar. I've been trying to find you for two weeks. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh. I found out quite a lot about you. I want to make sure I'm talking to the right man. I won't answer a lot of questions. Just one. It's not even a question. Callicles. Oh. Mean anything? I don't know who you are. I didn't even get your name, but you did find out. (laughs) If there were a man who had sufficient force, he would shake off and break through and escape from all this. 
he would trample underfoot all our formulas and spells and charms and all our laws which are against nature. The slave would rise in rebellion and be lord over him. So far as the police were concerned, there was nothing more to do. So far as the insurance company is concerned, we'll have to sit on a $100,000 bond and hope that David Parsons will return to his life in Los Angeles when he gets whatever it is out of his system. Expense account total, $1,100.59. Remarks? Just Mrs. Parsons, to me. She asked why he never talked about this to her. I told her he did. No one ever listened. She didn't understand that either. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, one of the most heartless, most vicious rackets an insurance investigator ever had to face. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Harry Bartell, Lillian Bayef, Will Wright, Gene Bates, Carlton Young, Lawrence Dobkin, Bert Holland, Marvin Miller, and Herb Vigran. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.